Hi everyone. In this video I will be showing you how you can generate bootstrap confidence intervals for regression coefficients when you have residual heteroscedasticity. And in particular we will be focusing in on the wild bootstrap in SPSS. So I do want to mention several things before we get started. First off, I am going to be using version 27 in this presentation. In previous versions of SPSS, uh, if you wanted to be able to perform bootstrapping you had to purchase an add-on mod module and it looks like that in version 27 the bootstrapping functions have now been incorporated into the base function so uh, that's a really nice addition uh, in the newest version of SPSS. Secondly I want to mention that underneath the video description you will find a link to the SPSS data file that I'll be uh, using throughout this presentation so you can download the data to follow along and additionally you'll find a link to a PowerPoint that provides some additional details that you might find useful. Then finally I should also mention that uh, I am not an expert in all things related to the wild bootstrap. I'm actually fairly new to this topic but it was something that I found sufficiently interesting that I wanted to share with you. So in the PowerPoint on the last page I do include references and suggested uh, further reading so I would definitely encourage you to uh, read up more on the topic if this is something that you want to uh, consider in your own work. So briefly before I open up SPSS let's talk about the data set itself. So the data set actually uh, is employee data. This is data that came with SPSS as one of the example files and I've modified it a bit so that um, I can use it in the way that I want to here. And uh, so just briefly taking a look at the data set that we're going to be working from, you'll what we're going to be doing is predicting uh, uh, salary increase for individuals uh, or individual employees. So this variable right here, diff, is one that I've created uh, based on the salary and salary begin variables. Basically it was just computed by taking the current salary right here and subtracting the uh, beginning salary right here. So we're going to be predicting uh, this diff variable from several variables in our data set which include education level right here, uh, job time right here, uh, previous experience, and then gender identification right here. So uh, basically I just kind of recoded this gender variable over here into zero for a person identified as male and one for a person who is uh, identified as female. So to summarize, what we're uh, predicting is an employee's increase in salary as a function of the amount of time uh, they've spent on their job, their previous experience, gender identification, and education level. So here I've opened up SPSS and let's start off just by quickly running the analysis and taking a look at uh, some of the residuals plots uh, to look uh, at whether or not even heteroscedasticity might be an issue. So I'm going to go to analyze down to regression and then click on linear right here and I'm going to move the diff variable to the dependent variable box. I'm going to move educational level to the independent variable box along with uh, months since hire so that's the job time variable, previous experience and then gender identification right here. So under statistics I'll go ahead and click on confidence intervals right here and then under plots I'm going to click on Z uh, predicted right here. I'm going to move it over. That's just basically the fitted Y values that have been standardized and studentized residuals to uh, the Y axis right here. And uh, I'll also go ahead and click on histogram and normal probability plot uh, just to kind of take a quick look at the normality assumption and uh, so we'll click on continue here and then we'll go to save and I'll click on uh, the unstandardized and sta uh, studentized residuals right here. So finally I will click on continue and then on OK and notice that when we uh, run our analysis here we get our unstandardized residuals right here and these are the studentized residuals and we are actually going to need these unstandardized residuals when we run our wild bootstrap. 
So really quickly, we'll go into our output and take a look at, uh, first off, our model summary uh, table. You can see the R square value is 0.394. Uh, so we would interpret that as indicating that the predictors were accounting for about 39.4% of the variation in the uh, difference variable. We have a significant uh, f-test uh, result. So from this, you would infer that the population R-square is greater than zero. We will go down a little bit further, and we have our coefficients table that's given. So we have our unstandardized regression coefficients, standard errors. Uh, over here, we have the standardized regression slopes. Uh, and then we have right here our t-value, uh, significance level, and confidence interval. And the issue of heteroscedasticity is important because uh, if we violate the assumption of homoscedasticity, that is the assumption of constant variance, then the impact is going to be on these standard errors right here. And the t-test that we are going to be computing right here, the observed t-value, is a ratio of the unstandardized regression coefficient to its standard error. So if the standard error is biased, then the t-value will be uh, biased along with our p-value and then our confidence interval. So that's the reason why this actually matters. So just uh, really quickly, though, uh, just looking at the unstandardized coefficients, you can see that education level and months since higher, both of those are positive and significant predictors, uh, whereas previous uh, experience and gender ID, uh, both of those ended up being negative predictors in this model. But again, those standard errors are not corrected for uh, heteroscedasticity if it's indeed present. So we'll just take a quick look at the standardized residuals, the histogram of the standardized residuals. Uh, this actually, this uh, chart right here and this one right here, the normal uh, PP plot of, of the uh, residuals, these really pertain to the issue of normality. And um, so that is one assumption of the least squares regression model. But when we talk about normality, it's normality of the residuals. It's not actually the normality of your dependent variable Y. Uh, nevertheless, if you have outliers and you have a non-normal Y, then certainly that factors into whether or not you would have non-normality on your, um, your residuals. So you can see in this uh, histogram right here, it looks like that we've got some outliers up in the uh, upper tail of this distribution. So uh, clearly it's not a normal distribution uh, f with respect to the residuals. And, and so we also have that uh, echoing of non-normality reflected in this uh, plot right here. When we scroll down and look at this plot, what we see is a fan-shaped pattern, and so that's one of the more classical patterns of heteroscedasticity that you might ex uh, observe with your residuals. So basically in this plot we have the studentized residuals that are plotted against the regression standardized predicted values. And uh, so it's basically uh, the X axis are the fitted Y values that have been standardized. And so as you're looking at this, you can see that at lower levels of the fitted Y values, you have really less dispersion uh, than you do at higher levels. So as you kind of move increase towards higher uh, fitted Y values, you see greater spread in terms of those residuals. So clearly there's evidence of heteroscedasticity in our residuals. We can also plot the residuals against each of the predictors to uh, gain a little bit more information about um, the heteroscedasticity. So I'm going to go to graphs, legacy dialogues, and go down to scatter dot right here. I'll click on simple scatter and define and uh, what we'll do is we'll move the studentized residuals that we had requested. I'm going to move that to the y-axis and just briefly go through each of the predictors. If we put educational level in here and click on OK, you can see that it looks like, again, we have evidence of heteroscedasticity. Uh, at lower le uh, educational levels, you can see there's less spread or dispersion in the residuals, whereas as when we move to the higher levels, there's greater spread. When we move down and uh, add in to our scatter plot instead of educational level we'll add in uh, the let's see here months since higher click on the x-axis move it over there uh, you can see there's less evidence of any kind of uh, heteroscedasticity it does look like we have some outliers in terms of the residuals but but there's not really any 
clear uh, evidence of heteroscedasticity going on in that particular plot. When we next add in the, um, let's see if I can find it here, previous experience, we'll move it over to the x-axis and click on add. Uh, it's a little uh, trickier here but there might be some heteroscedasticity. It does look like maybe there might be a little bit more dispersion at the lower end of, of previous experience and a little bit uh, or higher dispersion at the lower end of previous experience and maybe a little bit less dispersion on the higher end. Um, and then finally let's take a quick look at gender so our gender ID so we'll go in to uh, graphs legacy dialogues scatter dot again and we'll move the gender ID variable over to the x-axis here and now it looks like uh, you know looking at this the ones are persons who identified themselves as female and zeros are those that were identified as male so you can see there's greater dispersion in terms of the residuals in the uh, in the identified male group as opposed to the uh, group reflecting those identifying as female so now let's run our boot, our uh, wild bootstrap to generate a, uh, confidence intervals that are adjusted for heteroscedasticity. So the way that we can do this is to go back under analyze, go back to regression and linear right here. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reset all of this. So I'm going to clear out a lot of those previous selections and just put diff back into the dependent variable box and then our predictors back into the independent box. So there's previous experience, month since hire, and gender ID right there. And I'll go ahead and request under statistics. I'll go back to confidence intervals here. But basically I was trying to uh, undo the plots and the saves that we had requested previously. Um, we are going to be using this column of residuals when we run our wild bootstrap. So, uh, so it was good that we went ahead and ran our analysis to generate uh, this column of, of residuals. So next I'll click on bootstrap and this box is going to open up and I'm going to click on perform bootstrapping. The number of samples, the default is 1000, so um, if you want to raise that you can. I'm just going to stick with the default for this demonstration. We'll click on confidence intervals. You can see it's 95% by default. That's We'll stick with that. And then we're going to select bias corrected accelerated uh, right here. So I'm going to click on that and then continue. And so now that we've specified everything in our regression, we've made our bootstrap uh, specifications, I'm going to click on paste. And so when I do that, the syntax that's generated in the syntax editor is containing all of the, um, the selections that I've made up to this point. So you can see down in this part right here we have the regression, the regression model specification and options. And then right in this portion we have the bootstrap um, uh, selection and uh, various options. And so really all we have to do is to change this first line that has um, the command, the, the uh, subcommand for sampling. It says method equals simple. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove uh, the word simple and I'm going to type in wild. And in parenthesis I'm going to now type in residuals. So you'll notice that if I stop right here it's going to highlight in yellow and I do not want that to occur. I'm going to put residuals with an S at the end, set that equal uh, to the name of the uh, variable in our data set now that contains the unstandardized residuals which happens to be res underscore one right here and then in parenthesis. So that's literally all there is to it in terms of uh, modifying the syntax to generate the uh, confidence intervals using the wild bootstrap. So now I will highlight all of this and click my green arrow and so it takes a few seconds to run through because we've requested a thousand bootstrap uh, resamples. But you'll notice that in in the uh, output, first off you have a little table regarding the specifications. You can see the sampling method is uh, set at wild. There's the 1,000 uh, samples. Confidence interval is 95 percent. Confidence interval type is the uh, bias corrected and accelerated. And then you can see right here we're using the unstandardized residuals. So now when we scroll down we still get the same model summary information and F-test 
and the coefficients in this table are going to be exactly the same as before as well as the confidence intervals all that's the same uh, but in the next table we have our bootstrap for coefficients so you'll notice that first off the unstandardized uh, regression coefficients these are going to be exactly the same as what we had previously uh, when we were just using uh, the standard approach to estimating the coefficients and standard errors and so forth um, the difference comes into play with our, our uh, well several things you can see right here that we have a standard error that's given and these values are different from the these that are presented um, uh, in the table above uh, you'll also notice that the significance levels are different as a result of using the bootstrap um, results. And then finally, you can see that we have our confidence intervals. And so you can see that our confidence, confidence intervals differ in terms of their lower and upper bounds. And so basically, when it comes to uh, uh, referencing results in order to uh, test the statistical significance of my regression coefficients and I'm going to be relying on the results that are provided in this table down here as opposed to the table above. So that's basically all there is to it when it comes uh, in terms of uh, generating bootstrap confidence intervals using the wild bootstrap in SPSS. Again I would encourage you to download a copy of the PowerPoint that I uh, referenced earlier uh, as it does provide some additional details that you might find useful. So that concludes this video presentation and I appreciate you watching.